Now, if you'll take your copy of God's Word and turn to Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is toward the end of Psalms, uh, that collection of Psalms in the middle of your Bible. So if you have a paper Bible and you open it up to kind of the middle, you're going to get somewhere in the Psalms probably. And we're in Psalm 119, verse 121. Now, in 2016, a group of our pastors were talking about our preaching calendar and what we wanted to do. And one of the ideas we had was to take uh, three summers and go through uh, Psalm 119, to divide it up into three sections. Um, And we wanted to produce a, a music project, which would be the words of Psalm 119 set to music. And we were able to do that in uh, 2018, 2019, and then 2020, things were what they were then. And so this year, we are finishing up this project that's been going on for about five years. Now, there's two resources I want to tell you about. The first one is um, one of these. This is a bookmark that we produce for all of our series. It will show you what we're going to be, uh, where we're going to be in God's Word every Sunday, and it's a way that you can uh, take this home and read God's Word for yourself. And on the other side, there are seven questions to help you as you read and study God's Word. I want to encourage you to pick one up on your way out today. The second resource I want to tell you about is not yet available, but it will be very soon. We have a, our third volume in our Psalm 119 project that's going to be coming out very soon. It's, an, it's a, a, a way that you can get God's word in your heart. And Psalm 119 says, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against God. That's what we want. We want to hide God's word in our heart. Now, as we jump into this last section of Psalm 119, I want to give us uh, just some introductory things about the Psalms in general. So Psalm, the, the Psalms is a collection of 150 Psalms. They cover every range of emotion from anger to fear to, to grief. I mean, every, every emotion that we can have are, are included in this collection of Psalms. It was written by several different authors. David wrote more than anyone, 73. 49 of them are anonymous, uh, 12 of them written by Asaph, 11 by the sons of Korah. One is actually attributed to Moses. And so all of these psalms written by uh, lots of different people. They're poems, which means we don't read them like we would Old Testament narrative or the letters of Paul. They're, they're poetry, and so we read them so that we can have, um, w- so that these poems can engage our mind to create emotion in our hearts. That's what's going on. These poems are going to create pictures in our mind that then create emotion in our hearts. And one of the things that's unique about Hebrew poetry is that Hebrew poetry doesn't rhyme words. Not all poems do, but he- Hebrew poetry rhymes ideas, which helps because we're not reading Hebrew, we're reading English, Right? But the ideas are what rhyme in the psalm. And so you often, very often, will see two stanzas that have um, similar ideas. And what they're doing is they're trying to kind of uh, uh, amplify one another in their rhyme. And their songs, Peter, Paul, Jesus, they would have sung these in their worship to God. And so that's the psalms in general. Psalm 119 in particular is the longest of them, 176 verses. Very, very long psalm. It's 22 sections, each corresponding to a a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It was written to be memorized. I don't know if that intimidates you like it does me, but it was written for children to memorize it. Okay, one of the reasons we wanted to produce this music, the music projects was so that we could memorize and learn and get God's word into our hearts. Charles Spurgeon said this about this psalm. This psalm, like the whole scripture which it praises, is a pearl island, or better still, a garden of sweet flowers. So that pearl island idea was his favorite place in the world to go. Martin Luther said this, he loved Psalm 119 so much that he would not take the whole world in exchange for one section of it. So as we read this this, these last seven sections of Psalm 119 over the next seven Sundays, my prayer is that our hearts would love his word, that we would know him, that our hearts would love him, and that we would have a renewed love for God and his word. So let's jump into this last leg of this journey together. I'm going to read verses 121 to 128. I'm going to pray, and then we'll jump into what God's word says. Look at verse 121 with me. 
I have done what is just and right. Do not leave me to my oppressors. Give your servant a pledge of good. Let not the insolent oppress me. My eyes long for your salvation and for the fulfillment of your righteous promise. Deal with your servant according to your steadfast love and teach me your statutes. I am your servant. Give me understanding that I may know your testimonies. It is time for the Lord to act for your law has been broken. Therefore, I love your commandments above gold, above fine gold. Therefore, I consider all your precepts to be right. I hate every false way. Let's pray again. Lord, we ask that you would meet with us. We ask that you would show us wonderful things in your word. We ask that you would give us understanding, that you would deal with us according to your steadfast love, that you would teach us, that you would give us understanding, that we may know who you are and what you've called us to today. Help us, Lord. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Now, 176 verses in Psalm 119. 171 of them reference God's word directly in some way. Commandment, statute, testimony, promise, word, law. Some way God's word is referenced except for five. And of those five, two of them are in our section today. Verses 121 and 122. And what this sets up the section to be is much more like a prayer. This section reads much more like a prayer than some of the other sections do. And what we're going to see is this, the writer is asking God to do three things. He's asking God to save, teach, and act. That's what he's asking God to do. Save, teach, and act. Let's start with save. Look at verse 121. He says, I've done what is just and right. Do not leave me to my oppressors. Give your servant a pledge of good. Let not the insolent oppress me. My eyes long for your salvation and for the fulfillment of your righteous promise. So the writer begins by saying, he's been just and right. He's been kind. In contrast to those who would oppress others, he's done right. He's been just and right. And since he's done that, he's saying, God, protect me from others. He says at the end of verse 121, do not leave me to my oppressors. Verse 122, let not the insolent oppress me. So these are oppressors who are using their power wrongly. These are powerful people who are using their power to crush others, not to serve them. He calls them insolent in verse 122. It's another word for arrogant. Now, throughout the Bible, we see pictures of those who use their power rightly. They use power to serve. They use power to help. They use power so that others can flourish and thrive. Jesus himself uses power that way. And then throughout Scripture, we see others who use their power wrongly. They use their power to serve themselves. They use their power to crush others. Rather than using power to serve, they use power to crush and so the problem throughout all of human history is not that some have power and some do not. The problem throughout all of human history is that people use power to serve themselves rather than using power to serve others. And that's what the writer is saying. Do not leave me to those who would use their power to serve themselves rather than serving others. Even in the life of David, we see uh, both of these ways to use power. In 1 Samuel 24, David is running from King Saul. God has said that David's going to be the next king. Saul is trying to kill him so that Saul can keep his power. He's using his power for himself, not to serve others. And so David is on the run with his mighty men. They're hiding in a cave. In walks Saul to that cave. He's trying to use the bathroom. That's what the Bible says. So he goes into that cave to relieve himself. David's mighty men say, David, God has delivered Saul into your hand. Take his life and assume the throne. So the temptation there is for David to use power for himself not to serve. David looks back at his men and says, I will not touch the Lord's anointed. And so he takes a little corner off his robe. Saul leaves the cave. David comes out to the mouth of the cave and yells for him and says, Saul, your life was given into my hands, and I have not taken it. David did not use power in that, that instance for himself. He used it to serve. Now, 
Fast forward, there are other times in David's life where he did not make that choice. In, first, in 2 Samuel 11, it says it was the time when kings went out for war, but David did not. He sent his men out. He stayed back at home. And one day he's uh, in his palace looking out and he sees a woman bathing on her rooftop. She is not doing anything wrong or inappropriate. She is taking a bath, not expecting anyone to be seeing her. Well, David is king, sends for her. He doesn't send flowers or candy. He commands for her to come. He's using his power for himself. Commands for her to come to him. He uses his power to take advantage of her. She becomes pregnant. And then to make matters continually worse, David goes to get her husband who is out fighting a battle. In fact, his name is Uriah, one of the mighty men that was in the cave with David. And he brings Uriah back and he tries to trick Uriah into spending the night with his wife so that he can think the baby belongs to him. Well, Uriah is a man of character and says, the men in the field don't get this pleasure. I will not take it for myself. So David sends him back to the battle and tells the general, put him up front where the battle is fiercest. And when things get hard, everyone pull back so Uriah will be killed. That's David using his power for himself not to serve others. Now, certainly David is a strange example for us. None of us are kings. None of us are rulers. None of us have that kind of power to use and abuse for ourselves, but all of us have some power, and all of us have a choice. Will I use it to serve others, or will I use it to serve myself? At work, the power I have, will I use it to serve others? Will I use it to serve myself? At home, the power that I have, will I use it to serve others? Or will I serve it, use it to serve myself? David used his power to serve himself with Bathsheba and Uriah. And Jesus calls us to something different. He calls us not to be oppressors like the writer speaks of in verses 121 and 122. Jesus says this, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great must be a servant. And whoever would be first must be a slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. The one who has all power laid it down to serve. He says, and to give his life as a ransom for many. We're not to be those who use power to serve ourselves. We're to be those who use power to serve others. The psalmist says, I've done what is just and right. I've used my power for good. There are others who want to oppress me. And then he cries out to God in verse 23. He says, my eyes long for your salvation, for the fulfillment of your righteous promise. He cries out to God, save me. I long for your salvation and the fulfillment of your righteous promise. The psalmist is entrusting his hands to God. To use the language of 1 Peter 3, he's entrusting himself to the one who judges justly. And our, ha- our lives in the hands of God is really the safest place to be. And so David says, the writer, it's not David, the writer says, save me, save me. And then the writer moves from save to teach in verses 124 and 125. Read that with me. It says, deal with your servant according to your steadfast love. Teach me your statutes. I'm your servant. Give me understanding that I may know your testimonies. First thing I want us to see here as the writer asks God to teach, I want us to see the humility. The writer calls himself a servant two times. He says, deal with your servant. I am your servant. Then notice the writer appeals to his steadfast love. He said, I am just and right, but he doesn't appeal to that. He doesn't say, hey, God, I've done it right. He says, God, deal with me according to your steadfast love. Now, the steadfast love is a word, a Hebrew word, hesed, which is most closely connected to the New Testament word, grace. It's God's covenant love for his people. It's God's undying love for his undeserving people. And the writer doesn't say, hey, I've done it right, deal with me that way. He says, deal with me according to your steadfast love, your undying love for an undeserving people. That's how I want you to deal with with me. And then notice the humility of the, the writer saying, teach me. Teach me your statutes. Give me understanding. The writer is humbling himself before God. There is a connection between humility and teachability. 
You cannot learn unless you are humble. You cannot learn unless you can humble yourself before the one who is teaching. The writer humbles himself before God. And he says, teach me. Teach me two things. Verse 124, teach me your statutes. That word shows up a lot in Psalm 119, and it means what your word says I should do. Teach me your statutes. He wants to know. He wants to know what God wants him to do. And if you are a follower of Jesus, if you are a follower of Jesus, you want to know how to follow him. You want to know his word. You want to know what his word demands of you. And the writer is saying, teach me what I must do. But he wants to know more than just what he must do. He says in verse 25, uh, give me understanding that I may know your testimonies. If statutes are what God's word wants us to do, testimonies are what God's word says about him. So he wants to know not only what he must do, he wants to know who God is. He wants to know who God is so that he can follow him rightly. As a follower of Jesus, you want to know the Jesus you're following. One of my favorite authors is Jen Wilkin. She writes this about knowing God. She says this, the heart cannot love what the mind does not know. The heart cannot love what the mind does not know. That's why the writer says, give me understanding that I may know your testimonies. He says, teach me, God. I need to know. I want to know. So he begins, save me. Save me from those who would use their power wrongly. Teach me. Teach me, God, about who you are and what you've called me to do. And then finally, in 126, he cries out to God, act. Act. Read that with me. It is time for the Lord to act for your law has been broken. Now, this is not a demand. It sounds like one. It's time for you to act, God. It sounds like a demand. It's really not a demand. It's a plea. Notice the word Lord is all caps. That means that's God's covenant name. He's crying out to God in his covenant name as the God who keeps his promises. And he tells him, your covenant law, your word is being broken. Now, that word law, Torah, can mean commands, rules. Basically, what this is getting at is that things are being done that are not consistent with God's word, will, and way. And he says, God, it's time for you to act. God, things are not happening that are consistent with your word, will, and way. It's time for you to act, God. It's time for you to act, he says. And so, as with this writer, we could look around our world and we could see where this is true, where things that are opposed to God's word, will, and way are happening. When people are mistreated because of the color of their skin, that's opposed to God's word, will, and way. When babies are denied life in the womb, that's opposed to God's word, will, and way. When those who are powerless are trafficked by those who are powerful, and estimates are about a million image bearers a year are trafficked around the world. That's opposed to God's word, will, and way. And the psalmist cries out, it's time for you to act, Lord. Your your law is being broken. God's law is being broken. The psalmist's heart is being broken, and he asks God, to act. As I was reading this this week, I was reminded of the Lord's Prayer where Jesus says, pray then in this way, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the psalmist teaching us to pray in the same way. It's time for you to act so that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because there's things that are happening in my life, in the world, in our, in our community that are opposed to your word, will, and way, God. And so act. And so here in this section of Psalm 119, we see this writer crying out, save me, save me from those who would use power wrongly. Teach me, teach me what you want me to do and what you are like. Act, because your word, will, and way are being violated. Which leads me to a question. What made the writer the kind of man who would pray this way? What made him the kind of man who would say, I've done what is just and right? 
What made him the kind of man that would cry out begging God to work? What made him the kind of man who would pray in this manner? What made him this man? What what is it that made him this kind of person? And the psalmist answers in the last two verses. Verse 127, he says, Therefore, in light of all this, therefore, I love your commandments. He says, I consider all your precepts to be right. He says, I love love your commandments above gold, above fine gold. They're more valuable to me than all the money I could ever have. He says, I consider your precepts to be right. I hate every false way. And so what would shape a man to be this way? What would shape a man to pray this way? God's word. God's word has shaped him in this way. God's word has shaped him to pray this way. A man who would say, save me from those who use their power wrongly. Teach me who you are and what you've called me to do. Act. Because there are so many who are opposing your word, will, and way in the world. What made him this way? God's word made him this way. What shaped him this way? God's word did. Which leads me to my question, kind of how do we apply this section? Simple question, what's shaping you? What's shaping you? And when I say you, I mean us, right? I'm not, I'm not just this way. I'm, I'm like thinking about this myself too. What's shaping us? Something is. Something's shaping you, and it's shaping you toward a particular type of person. God's word in this section shaped this man to be a man who did what is just and right, who called out God for God to save him, asked God to teach him, asked God to act because his heart was broken, because God's law was being broken. So whatever is shaping you is shaping you into a particular type of person. So what is it? What's shaping you? Well, we can name, certainly name a few. You know, what we watch, listen to, consume is shaping us. So media, you know, podcasts, that's shaping us. Talk radio. You want to be mad at everybody in the world who's not in agreement with you? Listen to talk radio, right? Just be mad at everybody who's not like you. Sometimes the way um, news is reported uh, listen, I'm not, I don't have like this blanket negative thing to say about people in the media. Most of, them, most of them are just trying to do their job. But sometimes the way things are reported, it, it can really heighten fear and cause us to be afraid. It's shaping us. Advertisements shape us. Uh, some, some stats tell us that we see between six and 10,000 advertisements a day. And they shape us. We can have the newest of the newest of the new and see an ad for the next model. i got to have it. Got to have it. My my new and shiny is now old and done. I need new and shiny again. Right? It can shape us. Entertainment can shape us. We can say things that we heard on a movie. When uh, when our kids were little, Nathan's not here yet, so I can still tell stories about him without asking. So... um, When, when our kids were little, we watched a lot of Looney Tunes. I loved Looney Tunes growing up. Like, that was just my favorite thing. And so I would introduce my kids to them. And um, one time we were watching uh, Drip Along Daffy, which is about Daffy in this old western town. And Daffy Duck says to the bartender, 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 where's mine? As part of, this, part of the cartoon. Hilarious. Obviously, y'all aren't tracking as well. <clears throat> That's okay. So... The next Sunday, my son, Nathan, goes to Sunday school, and um, his teacher is serving their snacks, and he didn't get his yet, and so he bangs on the table, bartender, bartender, where's mine? <clears throat> Which blessed his mother who picked him up, and then she looks at me like, you have failed our family. <laughs> well, just keep the list, because more is going to be added to that. So what, what we watch, all those things, it shapes us to be a particular kind of person. Who you interact with shapes you. The people we are around shape us. That's one of the reasons community is important to us. So that we can be around godly people who are shaping us to be more and more like Jesus. You shape you. Do you know that no one talks to you more than you talk to you? 
No one talks to you more than you talk to you. And what you talk about is often thinking through all the ways that someone did something wrong, and you just kind of can shape yourself into a person that you would never really want to be if you're not careful. The psalmist has been shaped by God and his word. He knows of God's salvation and promise. He knows of God's steadfast love and grace. He knows of his need for God to teach him. And that's led to a humble prayer. God, save me. God, teach me. God, act in the world. Because people are acting in opposition to your word, will, and way. God's word has shaped him. So what's shaping you? Something is, and our goal in this series is that God's word would be shaping us. So here's what I want you to do. Over the next six weeks, between now and Labor Day, do you realize Labor Day is in six weeks? Which means college football is in six weeks, thanks be to God, okay? (laughs) Um, So for the next six weeks, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take this. It's going to tell you exactly what to read in God's word. And I want you every day to read the section that we're coming to on Sunday. Read it once. You can read it more than once, but every day, read it once. And I want you to pray this prayer, Lord, shape me by your word. Shape me by your word. That's what I want for us. And then when the the music project comes out, get it. Listen to it. Let God's word get into your heart and mind. All of us have a song that all we have to hear is a couple of words and it's just in there and we can't get it out. That's my hope for this music. That it would just get in there and it would never get out. That we would just know God and his word. That we'd be shaped by it. So that we can be more and more like Jesus. Jesus the only one who really did what was just and right. The only one who ever used power rightly all the time. And he had all power. And he never used it for himself. He always used it to serve others. Jesus, who lived, died, and rose again for our salvation to fulfill the promise, the righteous promise of God in his word. So that when we say, God, deal with us according to your steadfast love, we're saying that because Jesus purchased steadfast love for all who hope in him. So when we read God's word and we say, teach me your statutes, Jesus, we're saying, teach me what I am to do. Teach me how I am to follow you. And when we say, give me understanding so I can know uh, your testimonies, we're saying, Jesus, I want to know what you're like. And when we say act, your law is being broken, we need to start right here. It's real easy to talk about how everybody else is breaking God's law and miss how we're breaking it ourselves. And to say to Jesus, Jesus, I am a sinner. Paul said he was chief. I want to argue with him. I have sinned to fall short of the glory of God. But Jesus, because you died to secure the steadfast love of the Father, I can come to you and I can be clean. And maybe that's your story today. Maybe you came in here today feeling really messed up and broken and like this is your last ditch effort to feel loved by someone. And what I want you to know is that you're loved more than you could ever imagine. You're worse off than you could ever ever dream, but you're loved more than you could ever imagine by the God who created you. He loved you so much that he sent his son to die in your place for your sin, so that you could be accepted, made clean, and welcomed into his presence today. If you'll trust him. If you'll trust him. And when we pray, God, give me understanding so I might know your testimonies. Help me to know your statutes. He he always answers that prayer. (laughs) He's going to show us what we're to do. He's going to show us what he's like. Because he loves to do that. He loves to do that when we ask him. So what's shaping you? 
Is it God's word? Is it everything else? <laughs> My hope for this series is that God's word would shape us so that we would all look more like Jesus together. That's my hope. Let's pray to that end. Let's pray. Father, you're so good to us. You love us more than we can dream. You care for us more than we could ever hope. And so, Lord, I pray, I pray that your word would shape us, that your word would make us more and more like Jesus as individuals, as a church, that we would demonstrate the, the goodness of Jesus that we declare together. And Lord, that you would make us more and more like him. Lord, your commandments are like gold, like fine gold. All your precepts are right. Help us hate every false way. Every, every false way that would try to shape us into something that's not like you. Help us hate those things and love you and your word. Help us, Lord. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.